good evening everybody for architects and students and universities in india we have been joined by universities in southeast asia as well it gives us great pleasure in inviting professor jean louis cohen to the series of architecture talks on the council of architecture of india coe social reads forum welcome professor jean louis cohen <coughs> the forum good evening good evening the forum really reaches india southeast asia yeah sri lanka bangladesh so it's really a very large forum that's grown over the last one year uh the title of today's talk is very uh <coughs> intriguing it say it talks about neoliberal politics between naivete and opportunism <coughs> let me briefly introduce professor john louis cohen though, though he doesn't need any introduction Dr. John Louis Cohen is an architect, historian and a curator with a long track record in research on modern architecture and city planning. Since 1994, he holds the Sheldon Solo Chair for the History of Architecture at New York University's Institute of Fine Arts. He has been a curator for numerous exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art, the Canadian Center for Architecture and the Pompidou Center in Paris. some of his <clears throat> significant books among the over 40 books or more that professor cohen has so intensely researched and shared with us is building a new world <clears throat> uh, americanism in russian architecture and here i may point out that uh, professor cohen is one of the first and maybe only researcher of le corbusier's work in russia if i may you know add to that and it's a very intense research on russia not much was known about covid in russia and i think that has also been a source for the talk today uh, another book is uh, on frangeri a catalog raison of the drawing volume 1 54 to 1978 and then the lecobuse an atlas of modern landscape which was published in 2013 uh, really relooks at covid's relationship with the landscape and nature the future of architecture since 1889 and <clears throat> the other books are architecture in uniform designing and building for world war 2 uh, scenes of the world to come and then le corbusier and the mystic of the ussr jean louis cohen as i've already said is probably the single most important scholar of corbusier in the world today as described by professor michael hayes at harvard and i had a glimpse of that conversation and john lewis was one of the first to study the russian works of corbusier and oversee the <clears throat> definitive volume of towards an architecture we grew up on towards a new architecture and we had to completely revise our <laughs> uh, reading with towards an architecture because it made such a difference even in that famous quote that says it's a machine to live in and you reinterpret it as machine to reside in and that and the nuances and the manner in which that whole narrative changed and we are grateful to you for that i have a copy of this huge book le corbusier le grand which uh, jean louis kind of collaborated with tim bet tim betten and <clears throat> it's a heavy book it takes two or three architects in my office to bring that book onto the table <laughs> and it's a huge book but it really kind of reveals a whole kind uh, a whole narrative documentation on kobuzia so i'll briefly <clears throat> read the abstract of the talk and we really look forward to uh, professor cohen's uh, interpretation some complex some contradictory some problematic because that was the personality of kobuzia and i think at the end of it we are very keen to even uh, engage in a short dialogue with uh, professor cohen on on these insights and how they were revealed over time le corbusier politics between naivete and opposition the abstract triggered by the publication of several books since 2015 heated polemics have developed on the political engagement of le corbusier with the leading forces of the first half of the 20th century yet the view shared by these authors of a man viscerally committed to the right 
doesn't re- doesn't resist a more comprehensive analysis of his political passion. Kabuzia has also been engaged in a cyclical flirtation with the left and other forces, other political forces, I assume. Moreover, it's perhaps about time to consider him less as an agent of political power than as a manipulator of power in order to achieve his own architectural and urban goals. Uh, we now invite Professor Cohen to share his research and insights on the theme. <clears throat> Welcome, Professor Cohen. Many thanks, dear Durganan, for this flattering introduction. Uh, many thanks to everyone today. Uh, in the end, the benefit of this pandemic is to allow, her, to allow us to have this a kind of conversation which would otherwise be very difficult to organize. Uh, yeah. Many people would have to take airplanes, to, including me, to go to a, a particular place. And I think it's, uh, it's a good thing that we can really uh, exchange ideas. So let me uh, start with uh, the title of my presentation of today, uh, Le Corbusier between, uh, Le Corbusier's politics between uh, naivete an opportunist be, be, between his uh, uh, belief uh, uh, to a such simplistic belief in uh, the virtues of, of politics and the use he made. Let me say a few things about my uh, relationship to this uh, extraordinary uh, figure. I really love this uh, photograph by Lucien Hervé of Le Corbusier uh, looking out from the secretary building in Chandigarh at the, uh, at the high court uh, with his uh, sketches, um, with his sketchbook and his, uh, his uh, pencils, uh, in a way trying to record what he was doing in India. Uh, India will not be in the center of my story today, but is of course uh, uh, an, an extremely important aspect of uh, Le Corbusier's work. My own work with Le Corbusier has been mentioned by uh, Durgan and Balsavar. And um, I started, um, I've never met him. I was born in 49 and I was still in high school when he died in 1965, but he was, his shadow was everywhere in French architecture uh, when I was a student. And I started very early to go to places to meet with some of his collaborators who became friends and started writing. So this book on Russia, which has been mentioned, which to, was based on years of research in Russian archive. The centennial exhibition at the Pompidou Center in 1987, which I created together with, with Bruno Reichlin, and mo- really a, a vast quantity of investigations about his, uh, about his architecture and his urban design, including uh, this exhibition on, um, entitled An Atlas of Modern Landscape, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York now, eight years ago, uh, which was, I think, significant because it, uh, and in which this image was used a very, uh, very, very monumentally uh, to uh, challenge the idea that Le Corbusier was indifferent to landscape, that he was producing a typical building, buildings, buildings which could be repeated and without pay atten- paying attention to landscape. And all this, all his designs and his discourse proves the opposite, especially his engagement with, uh, with the landscape in Chandigarh, uh, which is particularly uh, a significant part of his work. So uh, now let me, um, yes, uh, uh, politics. Le Corbusier uh, and uh, Nehru, this is a, a very well-known photograph, which shows us that one of the main uh, one of the major strategies of Le Corbusier to get uh, to, to, to work was to so- socialize, to create relationships with uh, political rulers. Uh, this was a way of implementing uh, what uh, American 19th century uh, architect Henry Hobson Richardson uh, considered, it's a very famous aphorism, as the first rule of architecture. What is the first rule of architecture? You will ask, it's very simple. Get the job, get the job, get the commission. Then everything can follow. 
So in a way, uh, Le Corbusier was active during his own life to get the jobs, to get the, the commissions. And, um, and this is what he, he managed to do in India. But the story, if I say two words about the origin of the commission for India, uh, is a very uh, precise one. As, you, as everyone in India knows, uh, the first plan of Chandigarh and even the first buildings were designed by Albert Meyer and uh, the American uh, uh, planner and by uh, Matthieu uh, Nowitzki, Polish architect who died in 1950. And uh, uh, if Le Corbusier got the job, it was because of the political connections of newly independent India and the French state. He got the job because the French minister of uh, housing and planning recommended him to, to the Indians. Say, said that he was, so he, he, in a way, his, his engagement in French post-war politics was the very source of his, um, uh, of the commission he got for, to, to draw the master plan of Chandigarh and then a series of buildings. So all these things are woven together in, in a continuity. In the past years, especially in 2015, in 2015, the 50th anniversary of Le Corbusier's death was celebrated, uh, but in a very scandalous atmosphere where a series of writers uh, underline Le Corbusier's dealings during the German occupation of France. And this is what you can see here, the Nazi flag on Rue de Rivoli in Paris. Uh, Le Corbusier worked during the German occupation. He never went into hiding. He, he was not uh, only marginally and la very late part of a resistance. He spent uh, a number of months in the uh, courting the collaborationist government of Maréchal Pétain, the, the government which was uh, helping Germany to continue the war. And this uh, led to a series of uh, recent polemics. Uh, in the book on the right, a journalist called de Xavier de Jarcy considered that Le Corbusier was an ag agent of French fascism, which is a vast exaggeration, uh, even if some of his friends became fascists. And this is something we'll discuss. Uh, and this book of 2015 is just an echo of former books in which Le Corbusier had been accused, the two on the left, of being an agent of Moscow. So around 30, 1930, Le Corbusier was condemned for being uh, close to the, uh, to, to, the, to the Soviets, which he wasn't, although he had worked in Moscow. So in a way, uh, as André Malraux said, uh, uh, during the, the state funerals of Le Corbusier in 1965, he had never ceased, Le Corbusier had never seen to be aggressed, to be uh, criticized, to be blamed, uh, in particular for political positions which he never completely endorsed. And here I want, to, uh, I want you to read with me this quote of 1930. Le Corbusier was writing to Hélène de Mondreau, who was, uh, this lady, uh, was the hostess of the first SIAM, the first International Congress of Modern Architecture in, in, in her castle in Switzerland in 1928. And here you see, read what Le Corbusier writes, politics, I am colorless, as the groups created in support of our ideas are redressement français, military slioté bourgeois, that is right wing. Communist, socialist, radical, League of Nations, royalists, and fascists. And his conclusion is simple. When one mixes all the colors, uh, as you know, we get white. So it's a, a, a statement about, in a way, his indifference to politics, which was largely, largely true, not fully true. In a way, uh, he, it was a zero, uh, a zero sum game in which uh, his adventures on the right uh, equaled the adventures on the left. So I want to insist, as I had done in this Harvard lecture mentioned by uh, 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 Durganan before, I want to uh, today to focus es essentially on his relationship with the left, the French left. Uh, Le Corbusier, uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, was a pseudonym for Charles-Edouard Jeanneret, uh, with, who was born in Switzerland, 
in the industrial city of La chaux fonds and who aspired uh, when he started living in Paris, not only at being an architect, at being an artist, at being a writer, but also at being an entrepreneur, as being a business manager. And this is something very important and very little remembered. Uh, Le Corbusier in the 1920s identified with the industrialists, with the main, uh, with the owners of French factories, because he has his own frustration as an entrepreneur. Uh, here is the brick factory, sorry, which he uh, created uh, near Paris uh, in um, uh, during World War One. And uh, what he says substantially, and I don't want you to read all these long quotes, but he complains in 1919 to his friend, the uh, uh, writer, the Swiss writer William Ritter, uh, that the strikes of the workers is hitting uh, his business. So in a way he was by his very function as a small and, and by the way, unsuccessful businessman, uh, rather drawn uh, to the conservatives. Uh, Le Corbusier had some models in terms of politics and industry, and I will not be very long, but I just want to signal that in his, um, in his youth, he had worked in Berlin, uh, where his employer for a while was Peter Behrens, who was at the service of this man, Walter Rathenau, a very important German statesman, minister of uh, war industries during the war, ministers of, minister of foreign affairs, who uh, was uh, uh, also uh, writing about the future. And it's not a coincidence if uh, the uh, book of Le Corbusier Vers une architecture towards an architecture was translated in German with a title very close to that of the book here by uh, Rathenau. Uh, I'm going back a little more. Uh, what did it mean for Le Corbusier to be born in La chaux fonds La chaux fonds was a, a small industrial town which was uh, extremely uh, important in the worldwide production of watches. Uh, before 1914, La chaux produced 50% of the worldwide output of watches. So it was, the city was, uh, could be considered as an anti-manufacturer, as an anti-factory. And uh, Le Corbusier's father was active in this, uh, in this production. He was a small, uh, artisan and he was collaborating with the big bosses of the industry who, uh, whose uh, children would uh, uh, give some jobs to uh, the young Le Corbusier when he returned from the, his formative trips. Uh, Le Corbusier was, uh, or rather Jeanne Ray before 1913, his name before 1920, sorry, uh, was very, uh, very uh, sensitive to the political atmosphere in his hometown. What you see here is a very strange object, which I found in the archive of his cousin, Pierre Jeanneret. Uh, it is, these are the articles uh, Jeanneret, Charles Edouard, the future Le Corbusier sent from the East, towards the East from Greece and Turkey, which were printed in the local newspaper uh, of La chaux de in 1911. Uh, so, uh, uh, and they were glued by Jean Ray's father on this catalog of Alpine, of Alpinist supplies. But what is important here is to see Jean Ray, and again, I don't want to read in, in, uh, uh, in detail the quote, Jean Ray was very sensitive to the political atmosphere in his hometown. Uh, the department he had created in the art school was closed when the municipality turned socialist. So the quote you see here, is uh, uh, a sort of self-criticism, uh, a rejection of the socialist ideas he had uh, initially. Uh, in, uh, in this context, uh, the relationship to Germany was extremely important. I won't discuss it in detail, but he found in Germany inspiration, inspiration among architects like Behrens, among uh, industrialists like uh, Osthaus, who was a patron of uh, arts and, and design, and uh, 
his fir the first one of the very first book he started writing during the war, uh, the First World War, was a comparison between France and Germany. You see this layout sketch on the right, France or Germany, comparing the, the developments in the two nations. So a very uh, acute understanding of Europe's political situation. After the war, uh, uh, and the revolution in Russia. As you know, uh, revolution, uh, Russia was shaken by the Bolshevik revolution in 1917. Uh, the political situation in Western Europe was very tense. Uh, this poster, this frightening poster, shows us a caricature of the Bolshevik uh, uh, as a criminal uh, threatening the, peace, uh, the peaceful life of the French citizens. It was a voting campaign a poster, which gives you a notion of the atmosphere. In this context, in, the, in this context, Le Corbusier was drawn into a dialogue with the communist left, which is completely unknown, which was completely unknown until I started digging it up. Uh, he, uh, uh, he was raised, as I said, by uh, his father, a small artisan, by his mother. Here you see a letter uh, a, a, a drawing of his mo mother and uh, the text of a letter she wrote to him in November 18. This is the moment when a very modest, a very timid revolution was hitting Switzerland and her mother was expressed a fierce against the revolution. Uh, uh, a parenthesis here, which is more psychological and personal, but very important for uh, Le Corbusier, uh, uh, from 1907, when he first left his hometown to go to Italy, to 19, 1960, when uh, her mother uh, died at the age of 99 years, he never stopped writing her. He wrote her every week. So the, this correspondence has been, and sometimes twice a week. So these are thousands of letters which have been uh, now published and which are an incredible source to uh, to understand Le Corbusier's own positions. Uh, interesting why? Because uh, his elder brother, who was a musician, was considered as the genius of the family. And uh, he had to demonstrate to his mother week after week that he was the best. So out of this frustration, <laughs> we know th this situation in many families around us, perhaps our own. Uh, this is what Freud, Sigmund Freud call, calls the family novel. But in the case of uh, Le Corbusier, it was very characteristic. So we know much about his political ideas from uh, what uh, he wrote to and what her mother wrote to him. In 1922, Le Corbusier made it big in Paris. And this is, uh, this is the first of a series of urban plans, of urban designs at large scale, which led to the plan of Chandigarh, the contemporary city for 3 million inhabitants, uh, shown as a diorama in the Salon d'Automne. Uh, this uh, project was uh, uh, criticized by many, including on the left, uh, Jacques Menil, who was the critic of a communist newspaper, uh, was sympathized with Le Corbusier's ideas, but uh, criticized his architecture, uh, saying, uh, as, you, as you can read it, sorry, why create in the center a shadowy, totally insalubrious core, God, uh, when the solution of expanding of urban surface appears as more logical and also more consistent with the development of existing cities. So in, in short, in favor of garden cities. Uh, Le Corbusier mentioned some of them in his project and against the very dense city center, which would remain a feature of Le Corbusier's, um, of Le Corbusier's uh, designs for a long time. Um, at that time, Le Corbusier was looking for a title. And here, I'm glad, Dogenan, you've mentioned to what's an architecture. He was looking for a title and his first title was uh, what you see here, architecture or revolution. So a typically, typically political title, uh, uh, discussing architecture in the context of politics. And here, 
uh, I will um, uh, I will sh I'm showing you a, a little note, handwritten note by Le Corbusier about Menil, uh, uh, addressing Menil, and what he writes is very very clear. Urbanization is a formidable adversary of the agitator. It deprives him of his raison d'être, of his daily bread. What does he mean? That by uh, solving urban problems, by solving the problem of, of housing, of housing, political, uh, political agitation becomes meaningless. And this will result to the famous final sentence of uh, towards an architecture. Uh, you see here how he wrote this sentence uh, on uh, with, a, with a, a pen on the typo script. And I think this detail, sorry, is very important. You see here, architecture. Well, sorry, I have a problem with this pointer. Architecture or revolution. So this was the first title, the conclusion of the book and possibly his title. And then he adds a uh, revolution revolution can be avoided. How can revolution be avoided? Uh, by um, thanks to architecture, by providing good housing to the masses. So you realize here how uh, intense uh, was uh, this political question in the first years of Le Corbusier's campaign to seduce uh, the public opinion. Uh, then this, uh, uh, this program continues when he's, um, he, he goes to Moscow in 1928. And this is uh, of, a, a very important episode for all sorts of reasons. Uh, the Russians at that time were hiring Western architects, essentially, essentially Germans and, and Swiss, to build their new towns. Le Corbusier was invited to participate to a competition for the headquarters of the cooperatives. And he took this opportunity to, uh, to uh, uh, as you see here, to give a lecture on the future of the city. He became friend with a major figure of Russian constructivism, so uh, who was Alexander Vyesnin. Uh, I think one sees him on the right of this picture. Uh, to the point, and this is something I want to share with you, that he gave to the, the Russian uh, drawings which are still kept in Russian collections today. So he felt a very strong uh, sympathy for the Russians despite, despite the admonition of his mother against the, uh, the bloodthirsty Bolsheviks. And the result was the Central Soyuz building here seen in construction, completed in 1935, which remained the largest structure built by Le Corbusier uh, uh, until the completion of the Marseille block, the Marseille Unité d'Habitation in, in 52. This is something one tends to forget. The largest structure uh, of Le Corbusier for nearly 20 years was the building in Moscow, which he never, seen, he never saw completed, by the way, never saw it completed. So what he meets in, Mos in, in Russia uh, are his political ambition, is the idea that grand projects are important. And this is what he will translate in his own understanding of Bolshevism. As you probably remember from your history books, Bolshevik, Bolshevism, uh, the Bolsheviki uh, means the majoritarian, the members, of the majority group inside the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party before 1914. Sorry to be very, very specific about it. But for Le Corbusier had a different reading. He took the term Bolshe, which, which means more, which is the comparative of uh, large, of big, as a sort of program, uh, saying that the Russians were about grand projects and hence had to listen to him who had uh, the same grand projects in the sphere of architecture. And this theme is present in his readings of that period. For instance, when he reads uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's uh, Social Contract, which is one of the fundamental books of uh, enlightenment uh, uh, 
political theory, political philosophy, he underlines the parallels between, you see on, on the upper right, USSR, he uh, seems to read in Rousseau uh, the origins of his project of a grand new society. And this, of course, will be connected with uh, the French political situation. And now I'm returning to Paris. Uh, the left wing critics were embarrassed. This one was a cinema critic who uh, wrote in the, the same uh, communist newspaper uh, saying that Le Corbusier, uh, just uh, read the last sentence, Le Corbusier doesn't, does not believe in class struggle. Only one thing counts, the plan. So despite his uh, admiration for the Russians, he was considered by the French left as being exceedingly apolitical. This was Moussinac's critique, another critic, um, uh, and again, I don't, uh, I can, uh, uh, this, this uh, lecture is recorded and I could, uh, Doug and Anne, send you the PowerPoint, which you might disseminate and send to everyone interested. Uh, uh, here is another left-wing critic, Roger Ginsburger, who was, by the way, the brother-in-law of uh, Richard Neutra, Neutra, the Viennese architect who had emigrated to Los Angeles, he makes exactly the same critique. Le Corbusier is apolitical. And in fact, he was engaged in the 1930s in a, a group which was uh, particularly uh, complex uh, and contradictory. Uh, the group of uh, young reformers who published magazines, journals such as Prelude and Plan, and who were trying to propose a political line uh, which was halfway between the Russians and Italian fascism. So here, for instance, uh, we see on the right in this uh, newspaper uh, called Prelude, Prelude uh, the, uh, you see a page which is celebrating of his a volume of his complete works to, to Mussolini, to the ruler of Italy. Uh, celebrating what Mussolini had said in favor of uh, modern architecture, of young architecture. And he tried hard, uh, one has in a correspondence found the evidence, he tried hard to invite uh, when staying in Rome, Mussolini to an evening where he would have shown him slides of his projects. So he did a lot of work to convince Mussolini, but the conservative Italian architects prevented this from happening. Uh, he was in particular, yes, Mussolini had uh, under the uh, influence of what you see on the left, the uh, uh, panel or table of horrors, which had been uh, a collage by the young critic Bardi against conservative architecture, Mussolini has supported the Florence railway station by Michelucci, the construction of post offices, uh, of modern post offices, and Le Corbusier was drawn to this, um, uh, to this image of uh, fascism as supporting modern architecture, which was only partly true, very complex story. Yet at the end of the 1930s, when uh, the fascists and the Nazis bombed Spanish cities during the civil war, Le Corbusier was on the side of the Republicans against the Italians and the Nazis. So in a way, uh, the 1930s are a very complex period uh, where uh, uh, changes in the political situation appear every week. And in this context, Le Corbusier slowly abandoned, abandoned his um, ideal, idealization of fascism. He had a better time with the left. And here I'm mentioning a few uh, leaders of the left uh, very rapidly. Uh, one of the main parties was the rad so-called radical parties led by the man you see on the left, who had been a minister and who had been instrumental in having uh, Le Corbusier build his famous uh, pavillon of L'Esprit Nouveau in Paris in 1925. So his first very public manifestation 
after uh, 1922 had been made possible by a left-wing minister. Uh, the socialist commented very favorably on his work. This is a, a socialist uh, activist who uh, wrote in, his, um, in 1930 a piece on socialism and architecture celebrated, uh, celebrating Le Corbusier as a revolutionary. Here is a very interesting little book, which is um, a handbook of uh, architectural history for the trade unions, for the le left wing left wing trade unions, and you see the title from Pharaohs to Le Corbusier. Pharaohs to Le Corbusier, the idea that he was representing uh, an extremely uh, positive alternative, uh, the new aesthetics of Le Corbusier you see on the right. And he had, uh, he created very close connections with a series of uh, uh, mayors and local politicians. One of them is André Morizet, whom you see here, the mayor of Boulogne near Paris, where Le Corbusier had his own house, by the way. Morizet published a book on Haussmann and his predecessors on the transformation of Paris uh, in the 19th century, which really went into the direction of Le Corbusier's uh, interest for Haussmann, for the man who had modernized Paris. So a very strong connection with uh, Morizet, which led to the project you see on the right for a grand square in this city of Boulogne uh, on the doorsteps of Paris. Uh, not built, unbuilt. Uh, 38 was a little late, the war was coming. He also, Le Corbusier, tried in the 1930s to uh, uh, promote a project for the urban renewal of Paris. You see this scheme with long housing uh, indented buildings, which were largely, which were present in his 1922 project, but had been uh, reshaped according to his experience of the Russian uh, communal houses, which he had seen in the late 20s. So he tried for around between 1935 and 1938 to sell this project to a government uh, of uh, People Front, which was then ruling France beginning in 1936, a left-wing government. You see here uh, a demonstration of uh, the uh, left United Left Parties, the so-called Popular Front. Uh, in this context, Le Corbusier was drawn to the idea of building new types of structures which would respond to the expectations of the time. So in 1936, he designed this uh, center of popular festivities, which was a direct response to the proliferation of demonstration, mass rallies, etc. So in a way, this was two years after having written to Mussolini uh, uh, on the right side of the political spectrum, he was courting the left. And this is why uh, Dorganan has mentioned this, uh, perhaps, uh, yes, uh, this is why he, uh, we, could, we could say that his political attitude was uh, zigzagging, going from one wing to the next without changing the projects, taking equal inspiration from both sides. So uh, Le Corbusier during this period was part of uh, a very important uh, left-wing organization called the Maison de la Culture, the House of Culture, which had been created by two writers, André Malraux, who later became a minister of General de Gaulle, and Louis Aragon. Uh, and he was part of the Union of Architects within this Maison de la Culture, which was very important utopian organization uh, in which all the uh, representatives of creative, of a cre creative intelligentsia, writers, musicians, artists, uh, such as uh, Fernand Léger, for instance, uh, and also uh, as enfants, the former uh, partner of Le Corbusier, were engaged. So we see him in 36, and this Maison de la Culture promoted movies, uh, uh, new movies, uh, celebrating the revolutionary history of France. This one by famous uh, movie director Jean Renoir, La Marseillaise, was produced in this context. Also in this context, 
uh, heated discussion took place on the question of realism in painting. So uh, Le Corbusier, again, a few years after having uh, tried to seduce Mussolini, was now, now in contact with the lefting, left wing workers uh, and their leaders. This one, Vaillant Couturier, was uh, a member of parliament, a very active uh, leader of the left. And uh, I will give you, uh, it's a little complex, but maybe important nonetheless. Uh, I will give you an example of what I call the naivete of Le Corbusier uh, in respect to Vaillant Couturier. In, in the letter I'm quoting on the right, Le Corbusier pleads for what? He pleads for the deindustrialization of Paris, the cleansing of the unlivable illegal areas of Paris. So the idea of, and it was a very popular idea at that time that Paris was too dense and that industry had to be decentralized. But what was he thinking he was doing? Uh, Le Corbusier was writing to the le leader of a political party which found precisely his voters among the workers he wanted to expel from Paris. So this message was clearly the wrong message uh, of a, the right message sent to the wrong person. And this is what I call naivete because he had not, he was not, uh, he had not analyzed uh, what were in the end the political interests of the person he was writing to. So, uh, but, but, but he kept a very narrow contact with this man who died rather early and was a, a, a remarkable political intellectual. He was also in contact with Aragon, the, one of the most important French writers of the 20th century, who was also uh, a communist. And you see on the right a letter uh, in which uh, he um, is uh, asking Aragon to support him in uh, his endeavors to regain, to regain influence in the Soviet Union. And in particular, uh, the dissemination of his books. What you see here, uh, you see on the, at the bottom, uh, uh, the point nine at the bottom is tell to Moscow they should invite me. And here uh, also a figure, $5,000. Le Corbusier was still waiting for the honorarium for the Central Soyuz. And so he used in this case, he used politics, the, the communist writer in order to try to get from the Soviets the money he was expecting. So you see the level of naivete on one hand in uh, discussing with Jan Couturier in pleading and cynicism or opportunism in using these connections for his own interests. When Vaillant Couturier died in 1937, Le Corbusier was invited to a competition uh, in order to uh, uh, build a monument. And uh, uh, here, I think we find a very important uh, moment which uh, leads to further developments. This is the fabulous photo montage for this monument, which was to be me meant to be built on a large highway and which was probably the first monument ever designed to be seen from a moving automobile and not by pedestrians. You see the idea of a huge sign. And if you look at the monument, uh, you see a series of features. It is sculptural and it contains uh, three main themes. One is Vaillant Couturier's head, one is the book, because he was a writer of books, uh, the head of the speaker, of the orator, and the hand, this open hand, uh, this hand reaching out of, uh, of a building, which of course rings a bell uh, in India, and which has a very particular, a very specific political origin. What is this hand? This hand is the one, uh, the main uh, communist leader, Torres, hands out in a speech of 1936 to the Catholic worker. It's a very important political statement from the communist left. The communists were secular. They were anti-religious until, until then and very vibrantly. But what changes in 1936 in front 
uh, of course, do not forget that uh, Hitler's Germany and uh, Mussolini's uh, Italy were uh, threatening the peace in Western Europe, were becoming extra powerful. So the idea of the union with the Catholic, uh, the Catholic workers was an important one. And so the hand which we find on this monument here and there is the hand Torres reaches out to the Catholics, which becomes a main theme. Uh, and here you see the combination of all these elements, uh, the central motif of the project uh, comes from one side from the painting uh, of Le Corbusier, a painting of 1930, and Leeds uh, announces the sculpture. You see, the, in particular, the idea of a frame here, the sculpture he will develop in the later years. So this is 1938, basically, for early 39. Uh, in 1940, France loses the first part of the war, uh, the, the, the Blitz war uh, after the German invasion. And uh, Le Corbusier is sus suspected uh, of being a communist agitator. And here is, for instance, a report I found in the police archives inquiring about Le Corbusier's uh, political dealings. In his book of uh, 1938, uh, Cannon's Ammunition, uh, Le Corbusier was uh, uh, expressing a pacifist position. He was expressing himself against a future war, which would, uh, a future war which would, uh, sorry, a future war, Merde. Uh, a future war which would, uh, uh, of course, be um, uh, happened in 1939. And uh, in the first days of the occupation, again, he wrote to his mother, Marie Charlotte Amélie, about this book on, of 1938 as if it had been a prophecy of what would happen uh, after the German, uh, under the German occupation. You read his quote. His book rejected by the communists seems to be, seems to be the very letter of Vichy's uh, guiding ideas. So he uh, pretends after the defeat of France, again, moving from this time from left to right, if I can say so, that he was one of the originators of the conservative policies of the new regime. And this is on this base, uh, in a way, identifying with the first phase of the German occupation in which uh, rather uh, daring reforms were attempted. It is in this phase that he uh, can be considered as, um, as a negative uh, character and as, a, uh, as someone who sided with the wrong guys during the war. This is the reason, uh, this is the point of departure of the book I was mentioning before. Uh, it is also true that Le Corbusier had never ceased to, uh, to uh, uh, try to, uh, to appeal to the, uh, to the powerful, to what he called the authority, to the rulers capable of implementing his projects. This is, for instance, uh, as early as 1925 in his book, uh, City of Tomorrow, an homage to a great city planner, i.e. the king, Louis XIV, uh, whom he considered as one of the main representatives of this uh, city building authority. So after the war, after 45, uh, Le Corbusier's flirtation with the conservative and pro-German Vichy regime uh, uh, was forgotten, and he was uh, revived as a positive, as a positive figure by the left. Here, an article by Leon Blum, who had been a socialist prime minister and, and became again a prime minister after the liberation, uh, seeing in Le Corbusier one of the makers of the city of the future. And as a result, you know that he was given the job of rebuilding one of France's most destroyed cities. So this is the plan of Saint-Dié here which uh, was the 
final implementation of his city planning ideas, but which failed because of the uh, opposition of the local forces, despite Le Corbusier's attempt to mobilize his former friends from the left in favor of this plan. It's a very interesting episode in which the population rejects, rejects massively a modernist plan in favor of uh, uh, what, I was, what I would call the nostalgic reconstruction of a former city. Uh, in this phase after 1945, Le Corbusier is definitely uh, center-left, is anti-American, very much opposed to America for all sorts of reasons which I could explain. Uh, he, he, he is closer to the left and is es essentially close to a center-left figure who was also a reform-oriented Catholic, Eugène Claudius Petit. Claudius Petit had been in the resistance. He was a member of parliament and was for five years uh, minister of uh, construction and urbanism. He was the one who helped Le Corbusier to build some of his major projects. Here we see him standing in front of the Ronchamp Chapel. And here we see the Unité d'Habitation in Marseille. Finally, the point of arrival of Le Corbusier's ideas about housing. This project would never have been made without Claudius Petit. This building was made with state money in order to rehouse uh, inhabitants uh, who had left, had to, le to leave their houses during the war's bombings. But it would never ha have happened without the political support which Le Corbusier found no longer uh, among the e extremists of the right or of the left, but among the moderates, about the reform-oriented moderates. And this leads me to my last image, uh, which is precisely a letter to Claudius Petit, who was no longer a minister, but was still a very active, uh, actively engaged in French politics. And Le Corbusier again expresses the same theme as at the beginning of my uh, uh, rapid lecture, I have never been in politics. While respecting those who are in it, the good ones, so the good ones that were once listening to him, I've had a political gesture that's very important, that of the open hand, the day one, the day one of the two parties that divide the world for the sake of two different natures, i.e. the Russians and the Americans, forced me to take side, following a moral obligation. So a political gesture. But what you understand here very clearly is that this gesture of the open hand, which had a, a very precise political connotation in, 1930, in the 1930s, uh, the hand uh, reached out to the Catholic worker had been transformed into a more, uh, a much vaster uh, symbol of humankind. And uh, uh, in short, I would conclude it here by saying that uh, it is with all these zigzags, all these uh, different types of flotations, and through his ability at assimilate the political language, and I would say regurgitate it, reshape it, for his own purposes and for much broader meanings that the genius of Le Corbusier uh, is revealed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cohen. Um, wonderful rendition and uh, I think quite intense as well as dense. So, I was thinking more because this is the context of India, this is the context of Southeast Asia. Uh, while we would raise questions, we would raise questions which have a certain resonance with what we are grappling with and struggling with. Absolutely. India, you know? But it would be in the context of your lecture. So I would not move out of this uh, theme, but I think the underlying question. You know? The first, I think, and this I find... Uh, a lot of what you presented has a much more profound or deeper value because uh, beyond, if we were to see it beyond Kabuzia, beyond the 30s and 60s, a lot of the issues that you have brought out 
uh, are actually almost persistent, those contradictions and complexities even today. You know, yes. whether an architect is working with the left, an architect is working with uh, the right, or how he positions himself, uh, it's something which is a reality even today. It is not as historic as it appears, you know. And which is why, as you rightly put it in the beginning, the focus here is not to pin or crucify an architect as he's left or right, or, but to really look at how does this architect negotiate or how does this architect struggle with these different forces. You know? And so when you say Kobuzia said he was colorless or he writes to his mother to uh, be the good son and say that, you know, I'm not political. Uh, I have a, this is just a question and if you wouldn't answer it, it's fine. Do you think Kobuzia placed the humanism of his architecture above politics? That politics looked so petty to him at some deeper level and it could be anything, but his focus was on some ideal notion of architecture which he had in his mind. Would you, would you say that or would yes, you say that the conversation goes to left and right? What is very clear is that Le Corbusier sells, if I may use this term, sells the same projects to the left, the center and the right. So he's not, there is no inflection in his, uh, no compromise in what he does as an architecture. And mm. even if he know, uh, sometimes he, he tries, but he never goes very far. So in a way, politics for him is a medium. Sure. So that's the main thing. Politics is a medium. The politicians are here, should be at the... He aspires at representing a higher level of values and projects than the politicians, and therefore asks them, put, insist that they should follow his, uh, his guidelines. So politics is not the goal, it's a medium. Wonderful. So would, would, it, would it mean that when <clears throat> there were kind of two Kobuzias here, one who was uh, completely committed to his value of to architecture and humanity. And I think in an earlier talk or an earlier of your writings, you brought in the Freudian aspect of something yes. which is manifest and something that is latent and hidden. Yes. And uh, so is it that Kobuzia, why would you think that Kobuzia has to labor or struggle to manifest that he's not political? Uh, when he, at another level, he's engaging with this, uh, these same forces. Yes, you, uh, well, I think he, he, it's one of the complexities of this period. Everything was political. Everything was political. So. Uh, Le Corbusier used politics uh, as a medium to make, to build his projects or to get commissions, but also to, prop to propagandize his ideas. So he used the loudspeaker of politics uh, and of politicians to, uh, uh, to, to find support. And what was also therefore sometimes uh, criticized and, uh, and stigmatized. Uh, people who wanted to kill his projects uh, said that he was too left. This is why he, he worked for 12 years, for instance, in Algiers. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe not, well, at least 10 years to build and design uh, more than 10 projects, none of, none of which were, uh, were built because at the end he was considered as being too, too radical. So I think he uh, uh, sometimes he suffered in his, uh, uh, in his professional life of the attempts he made Again, sometimes naively, sometimes opportunistically, to to have the authorities support him. So it was not always. He never played the role. We know now. Um, we are aware of the role certain architects who who remain very close to the uh, to power had. Uh, there are some people like Speer in Germany, Piacentini in Italy, Jofan in Russia. Uh, who had a, uh, a certain cynicism in respect to their own design positions, but Le Corbusier had no cynicism. He believed mm -hmm. in his ideas, and 
And again, try to sell him uh, sometimes in complete contradiction with the values of the people he was speaking to. Yeah, sure. And uh, if we can take this idea of values and maybe move it to a, a conversation on the kind of typology or manifestation. Yes. How do you see or where do you think that when Jacques Menil in 1922 writes about the uh, left city, you know, the city of the worker, mm -hmm. why does he resist? Uh, Kobuzia's typology because it, it kind of uh, later on reflects what Russia does as social housing. Yes, but yeah. uh, uh, well, I think at that time Russia has not done anything. Uh, they they only resume building significant housing you know, two, three years later. They're still in the civilian war. So Russia is not the issue. At that time, the, the, the leading ideal, uh, the main ideal for almost every reform oriented. Uh, intellectual or politician is the garden city. Okay. It is the mod, even for the Russians. Okay. The Russians start by building garden cities. And Le Corbusier hates the garden city. Yeah. He hates it. He was always, a, a, he loved it in his early, uh, yeah, early right, years. Yeah. And this is, uh, it's very interesting to see how it changes completely his positions in respect to, to, to city planning. Uh, uh, during the war, but ma mainly during the war, and and completely rejects city planning, completely rejects the picturesque urban design of Camille Lozita, which he, the Viennese, who, which he had uh, uh, celebrated before. So he changed, and, and, and he's in favor of the uh, dense big city, which has been uh, an, a set of ideas which come uh, from America through the German prism. So it's another story. How mm. do the main ideas of city planning migrate from one uh, area of the world to the next? So although he's critical of New York, sees in Manhattan's, in Manhattan uh, a great disorder, a great chaos, he's, he's for a sort of orderly interpretation of the North American vertical city. Sure. sure. Please. What also comes through in this uh, conversation, and I would say most of your writing, is this weaving of Kobuzia's own autobiographical position with his theoretical position. There, were no, there was no separation of the two. It was almost so he is born in a family where his father is probably working for a Jewish boss, as you described him. And so I think in one uh, text you write that it's probable that the father comes home in the evening and keeps complaining mm. about his Jewish yes. work. And at the same time, the early really good commissions that Kobuzi gets are again from the children or the generation of the same yeah, Jewish yeah. family. You know? So does that set up a certain contradiction for Kobuzi on how to position himself yes. uh, in this kind of uh, context? No, that's what makes him interesting. Otherwise, he, he would be unbearable as a human being. <laughs> it's uh, all these contradictory aspects and this... Uh, uh, also, there's a difference between the public and the private figure. So if mm -hmm. we take this question of uh, anti-Semitism, which has been raised, mm -hmm. which was very widely, uh, widely, uh, I would say, uh, present in in the French and Swiss French uh, public opinion at that time. So it was a, a dominant attitude, a dominant attitude. Sure, sure. Uh, but Le Corbusier never made public statements and he started changing uh, when, he, when he had a better grasp of, uh, uh, of society. So, um, but of course there is initially what I, what I would call following Karl Marx, a sort of class base, uh, a class base to it. Uh. Absolutely. From, from that point, because <clears throat> how would you interpret Kombosia at one level collaborating with a political force and at another level attempting to, the way you presented, I'm just uh, kind of yes. paraphrasing what came to my mind. If I'm not right, you can change mm -hmm. it. Because what you seem to be saying is at one level, he did collaborate 
with a political force because he knew that that force could deliver his dream. You know, whether it's the city center in Firmini, which fails, and then he does other things with it, or whether it is the idea of social housing. But he needed an agency, and the agency became the political force. But at the same time, he is always reluctant and distancing himself from that same force. Would it be right to uh, assume that, that he is aligning yes. and collaborating at the same time, distancing from that force? Yes, I think he doesn't want to be, uh, he doesn't want to be on the podium uh, together with the political leaders. Mm. All that he wants is doing the project, is the decision. And so yeah. he's, he's also operating behind the scenes, operating mm. be behind the scenes through correspondence, through, through his agents. He's not, and he's very careful in his uh, published writings not to let anything transpire. So, uh, but at the same time, uh, one of his frequent attitudes, which uh, I have commented upon a long time ago, is what I call the overbidding. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's it's a so it's a ma he has a certain manner of interiorizing the discourse of uh, of the politicians or of the industrialists. I will give you an example which might ring a chord in uh, India. Uh, uh, he worked for the Czech shoe manufacturer Beta, Batya, yeah. which, which is very present, was very present in India Even from the 30s. Even, Even, now. Even now. So, and built this Batya Nagar a city, that was in the, one of the new towns. So he worked, he, he tried to work for, Bat, for, for Batya, uh, I pronounce it the Czech way, Batya, yeah. Uh, yeah. for a number of years. And uh, he designed in 1935 uh, a system of stores, very pioneering system of uh, shoe stores for Batya, which could be industrialized and, and built in many cities. And when you read him, he's teaching Batya how to sell shoes. So it's not only the way he will teach the Russians to be better Bolsheviks by building his project. So very, this is another example of what I would call a sort of boastful, uh, a naivete, uh, uh, trying, and, and in the end, it fails also because his clients find him unbearable. They find, tend to psychologize the situation because they think that he's doing too much, that he will uh, not take their, their, their seat, but will, be, uh, will take too much space. So it's some, but this passes through this overbidding. He's asked by Batya to be uh, in a competition jury uh, and to give some ideas about planning, he returns with a plan. The mm -hmm. same thing with the Soviets. Uh, he's asked to design a building uh, in 28. He comes back uh, proposing to reshape the entire city. So mm -hmm. there is this, uh, you, you can call it generosity, you can call it ambition, you ca can call it uh, 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 aspiration of grandeur. Uh, for me, it's, it, it's, it reveals also one of, uh, I think the most compelling and probably positive aspects of what architecture is, uh, yeah. which is uh, not been happy enough, like in engineers solve technical problems. They won't challenge in most cases what the question which is asked. They will solve it. Yeah. Uh, only the very, very uh, grand ones can do that. Uh, architects tend to say, uh, okay, I am, and this is not the right question. We have to reshape the problem in a different way. And so uh, this is what I think uh, is also touching in, uh, in Le Corbusier's uh, responses, which are, of course, always. Sometimes we know today the response of a honest designer can be, uh, you don't need a building. <laughs> there are other ways of solving your problems. For Le Corbusier, there was no question that there had to be a building. <laughs> See, and since you brought in Bata, I, I say Bata because they say Bata. In India we Your say work, Bata yes. and, uh, and So <clears throat> another discussion that was underlying your presentation was that Kobuzia was not only having pre-decided thoughts, but each time he went into a certain culture, whether he went into Moscow, whether he went into Prague, mm -hmm. and that experience of the I think you're right about the experience of the Bata 
center, city center show, you know, where they have this big show with people and uh, yes. and and that kind of makes him rethink about what a city center can be, you know. Yes. And could you could you because that was to me a very uh, <clears throat> new thought that something happening in Prague, and he sees it from a shoe company and sees a certain scale, and then starts reimagining a city center of music, of of celebration, of festivity. Could you elaborate a little more yes. on yes. how that happened? Batia was a very complex system. I mean, Batia created was born out from a small town called Zlin in Moravia, east of Czechoslovakia. And uh, this small town, which is still existing, is what I would call a Christ, together with Chandigarh, is probably the only other purely functionalist city ever made. Because it's, uh, and in this city uh, of Zlin, where you had a rigid differentiation of uh, uh, housing and production, it was the prototype for ba Bata Batanagar, for uh, Bataville in, in France, for Batawa, Batawa in Canada. Uh, they uh, were a very early multinational using architecture in a very subconscious way. And, but the component of culture was very present. So in a way, when you look at Le Corbusier's plan for Zlin, the plan he made, many things announce uh, Saint-Dié and Chandigarh. So, Again, there are key buildings which, for instance, in his plan for, uh, for Batia in Zlin, you find the spiral of a museum, which oh, yeah. will later okay. develop into the museums in Chandigarh and Ahmedabad and Tokyo. Okay. So, uh, I mean, there is also what I would call a sort of intertextuality between the projects. Mm. So a sort of uh, a process in which these, the components of this project, the syntax, i.e. the general articulation of urban forms and the lexical elements, which are the single buildings, uh, are uh, transformed, uh, displaced, reshaped, retransformed in a sort of flux, which goes from the moment in which the language begins to be established, maybe the end of the 1920s to the, to the last moments. Sure. So I think that's what happens in uh, if you where you mention in Firmini as in this lecture you've not mentioned it but your writings show that in Firmini he was very keen to bring this Bata idea as a city center. If I'm not uh, was that so that he wanted to bring? Yes, it there? yeah, yes. But in Firmini he never had the opportunity of working much in the center. So mm -hmm. he um, uh, there was uh, well Firmini was a mining town. It was a coal mining town, so the presence of industry was very strong. But I don't think he, uh, uh, I think, was already be beyond that. And he was, yeah. he, uh, don't forget that in Firmini, he, he, he was not the, the city planner. Okay. The city planner was a guy called Andre Sive, a former student of Perret, who was a very interesting uh, professional. Le Corbusier was asked to do a housing building, a church, a stadium, uh, but not the plan, not the plan. Okay. Because another theme which seems to be unfolding, and this is even the idea of how do you conceive of a city center? And in that conception, if his early work, I think it's the product of the <clears throat> insalubrous, I think you called it, yes. the 1920s. And he seems to, I think even today in India, we're grappling with this idea of the traditional city fabric and uh, maybe demolishing parts of the traditional city fabric to uh, build something that is an insert or sits very uncomfortably. Uh, <clears throat> what was Kabuzi's position on that? Because while he doesn't write too much on it, or does he write, there are so many drawings of how he uh, does the surgery of center Paris. Yes, I think Le Corbusier was, um, I don't think he had a, after having dropped his early ideas about uh, uh, before 1914, which were based on the observation of medieval uh, cities, 
uh, and Renaissance cities, there is a very important moment, and I think which leads to Chandigarh and other projects. And maybe I will uh, show you this. Uh, uh, I, I will show you one drawing. Uh, let me look for it. Uh, and I will share my screen again. Sure. Uh, you will see what I mean. Uh, it's a drawing which was made, which he made in 1915 when he was working at the National Library in Paris on his project for, uh, on his project for uh, uh, a book on city planning. So let me show it to you. Um, well, wait a second. Um, share my screen. And uh, yes, and you see this drawing, okay? It's a drawing of Rome. It's traced at that time. There were was no Xerox. There was no scan. You had to redraw everything by hand using a, a, a sheet of glass put on the book. So he did that, and you see these various parts of Rome. This is a, the plan was made by Piero Ligorio, the architect of Villa Medici in Rome, in uh, 1661, I think, or 1662. And uh, Jeanneret traced. Uh, made a drawing in which he simplified it. He got rid of everything which was fabric and reduced the city to a composition, to an assembly of single buildings. So it's not a city of continuous fabric. It's a city of monument. Mm -hmm. And he writes here, this could be, uh, believe me, uh, this uh, monumental composition can be seen as a prototype, you read prototype, of a modern city uh, among the trees. So he sees uh, in this simplified version of Rome where uh, buildings are playing, their, playing on their own the base of what he will later do. And I think that this drawing, which he used also in, uh, towards an architecture, is a very important base for his discourse. Sure. But I think uh, there then is also, because you brought this drawing now, uh, would you say that with this drawing, his focus on primary forms yes. as, as, you know, some, as something to imagine within the city became important? It's the idea that the city is primarily uh, objects in conversation. And it's more about... and. Uh, He's not so much interested into the, uh, uh, what I would say, the collective practices of a city center. This is something which is missing from his writings. Mm -hmm. Even if he was happy to live in Paris and uh, 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 go to the cafes and have his uh, drinks in the cafe and goes to, uh, to restaurants and meet people, his practice was a very urban metropolitan practice, but his message was a different message of message. Uh, was about something different, was about the idea of an uh, uh, orderly, of a reordered city of objects. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So which means that something like that had to be facilitated or state delivered uh, if it had to emerge, you know, like Chandigarh. It had to, uh, his imagination of the city had to be state delivered, delivered not, by the state. Not necessarily state. He, again, let's uh, think about this notion of the authority. The authority could be a private business. He courted Batia, as we know, Bata. He courted Olivetti. Mm. He, uh, he was in dialogue for, with Olivetti for uh, nearly 30 years. He courted uh, Fiat in the, 19, uh, in the 1930s. Uh, so he was expecting it from various sources, from governments, from cities, from uh, uh, powerful capitalists. Uh, and again, the model here goes back to Berlin. The model goes back to the studio of Behrens working for Rathenau and the AEG uh, electrical, uh, electrical monopoly. So he had a very strong model of the architect as a form giver for uh, indus an industrial civilization. I think stated very well the form giver of an industrialized city, you know, the contemporary city. Yes. Uh, if I just 
for a minute go back there was one part where you actually mentioned that kobuzia religiously wrote a letter once a week to his mother for some two mm-hmm. yes i i can assume that it must be a whole uh, <clears throat> 40 50000 i don't know how many letters is that that becomes mm-hmm. over 53 years but in that one significant letter that you mentioned uh in an earlier in your writings was the fact that and you brought that here as the possible cover of architecture of revolution and uh, you know the fact that kobuz is now dealing with architect because when we were in the 80s uh those sentences from towards that time it was towards the new architecture uh <clears throat> were, were resonating with us and if you in your writings you say that kobuz's mother was very concerned you mentioned it today was concerned about this micro revolution that maybe happens in lasho the form maybe as a a year after the russian revolution yeah. 17 and 19 yeah. and the paradox is his writing to her and you mentioned that he goes to moscow was there a conflict because of that what what have you found? yes sir. No no her mother was really very scared when he went to moscow she okay. she wrote him a letter which i quote in my book on the, the mystic of the ussr saying be very careful these are dangerous people they're all jews so there is a little hint at uh, uh, of uh, antisemitism be careful my son uh, they will use you uh, and he brushed that away because he's so uh, it's the first time after all let's uh, realize what it means for mm-hmm. him it's 28 it's the first time he, he has received like a uh like the russian right in the yeah. press the very figure of the new man so he's received uh, at a time in which m- most russian leaders had been in exile in paris so you should mm-hmm. not un- 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 uh, underestimate this fact because he represented uh, almost what i would call paris fashion <laughs> uh, so, so uh, for him being welcomed in moscow was something completely completely new and exciting and just one anecdote which is also uh, which will speak to uh, to architects in the audience um, he took part to this competition for the headquarters of the cooperatives and at some point all the russian participants wrote a letter to the jury saying um we don't deserve this project there is the greatest architect of the world give it to him so i don't know of any other competitions where the architects in which involved sign a letter saying that they don't want the job but someone is more qualified than them <coughs> wonderful i think yeah this is probably then the only large commission competition where the others participating grants kobuzia the 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 you know but i think you also mentioned that he was never compensated or paid for that uh, he was he was very late was? i have um, okay. and this is something and, i i uh, I'm, i'm interested in um and uh, of course it would be uh, i would have to spend another life doing that but uh if you want to understand how architecture operates you have to look at form this is clear at form at ideas at but you also have to look at money where does the money come from when does the money come from how architects are compensated what is the impact uh of compensation on the way they work i'm working currently on frangieri uh very much uh i've just spent one week uh Uh, having it, him speak about his early projects and, and it's clear that the question of money is are very important for him uh when you read the correspondence he's very often paid by the hour he, he doesn't have a proportional fee so of course this has an impact on the time it takes to work on a project if a client is not fed up and stop him he can continue forever to develop a project this is not the obvious case so uh, in the case of uh, of of moscow the uh, committee finally got his money just before mm-hmm. the outbreak of world war 2 and okay. this is 
it, 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 this were pre-1929 mm -hmm. dollars. With that, he was able to survive during the war, even mm -hmm. diffi with difficulties. So he finally got his money. <laughs> you know, I, I think another what you mentioned was a very interesting, it's a revelation that a young architect, uh, when Kobuz is young, he actually begins to do a comparative book between France and Germany. You know? And I think it's a time between the 1820s and uh, 1870s and 1920s. Isn't yes, that's yes. the kind of time that he's mm. focusing on. Uh, what do you think drove his interest? Could it, now I'm just stretching myself a little. I could, uh, at the same time, it was his father as a watch engraver was probably on the verge of losing his job because mm. of industrialization. Uh, would you see a connection between no. this or there's no connection? No, this is this is a clever idea, but it's not true. No, uh, I'm just, I'm the just... book, no, no, the, the book, there, the, it's precisely documentation documented in in his correspondence with uh, Ritter, the Swiss writer, and also with uh, Auguste Perret, his uh, mentor yeah. in Paris. Uh, in uh, the early years of the war, uh, Le Corbusier, uh, let's call him Jean Rett, who was a great supporter of Germany, changes his mind. Uh, like many uh, French people and intellectuals or French Swiss, he's impressed by the bombing of the Reims cathedrals by the German army in 1914. So this bombing, which will be very, very well uh, exploited by French propaganda, will turn the French intelligentsia under, uh, against Germany. And at the same time, the Cubists and all the modernists in France are criticized by the conservatives as being German agents on the side of the Germans, which were, it is true, the first collectors of Rodin, Picasso, etc., were, were often Germans. So the idea uh, Jean Ray has is to write a book which would say no. Uh, we are not German agents because the Germans have copied France. And the book is a sort of comparative history. Uh, and this is what you've seen of a sketch, uh, the uh, layout sketch, France, Germany on the left, France on the right. And we see the parallel developments which show that the Germans have captured French ideas and then have translated and made them better. So a sort of uh, another zigzag, but uh, in which uh, initially the ideas were all French. And he will be uh, extremely hostile to, uh, uh, to Germany during that time, uh, very critical of uh, expressionism in architecture, although he would be supportive of the Bauhaus, and he would never very much respond in German to people who were writing him in German, with one exception, uh, Miss van der Rohe, the mm -hmm. only guy to whom he uh, responded in a, a rather faulty German was right. Miss. True. So it's a, very, it's a very interesting story. I've done a little book on this topic, uh, on the history of not an unpublished, but an unwritten book, because he never completed it. Very wonderful. And I think you also state that the Germans were copying France and then could do it better because of their ideas of efficiency, organization, industry. Yes. I yeah. think you uh, yeah, yeah. think that. Which is uh, a cliche. It's a, it's a cliche also. It's a mm. sort of cliche to mm. say the Germans are organized. Uh, mm. I think that uh, the myth of German organization has been created precisely because initially the Germans were not organized. So they had okay. to uh, it's, it's sort of inversion of what was the perception. Okay, so it's more perception and uh, myth, you know. Yes. I, I'll come to the last few uh, questions and then we can... <clears throat> Something that resonates, and you said that, resonates with India. And I think it, if you said it started with uh, the communist symbol of the hand uh, speaking to Catholic workers, because that open hand eventually uh, finds its real emergence in Chandigarh. 
Sure. And much, much after Kubuzi's death, I mean, I really didn't really get a chance to see the court of contemplation. Yes. But what is fascinating in your research is how Kubuzi engages with the open hand and then adds meanings to the open hand based on this zigzag. Uh, could you give a few anecdotes on how he morphs? Because I think in one presentation, you discuss how the hand becomes very strange because now it doesn't have a front and a back, but has two fronts. Yes. And, uh, well, you... I, 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 I can't go much into details because uh, I've not studied it well. So I've not studied the, the, the transformation, but it's true that uh, the uh, what I would call the adventures of the open hand are also part of uh, uh, the, the intense post-war work done by Le Corbusier on symbols, on signs, uh, on animals, those you, you find on the uh, door of the assembly in Chandigarh, mm -hmm. in the tapestry of the high court. So he creates a sort of zoo of animals and forms and symbols, which are all uh, assembled in his... Uh, a famous poem of a right angle. So I, uh, I think it's uh, it's also belonging to another important shift in his uh, in his work after the war, which is the um, exploration of sculpture, because sculpture he, he, he had never made sculpture until the 1940s, and uh, and what one could say one could draw a parallel between the paint the the buildings of the 20s which are related to his paintings. And this has been demonstrated by many of my colleagues very well. And in the 50s, uh, sculpture becomes a source. Uh, if you look at Ronchamp, for instance, Ronchamp has no, not cle no clear relationship with the paintings, the post-war paintings, but a clear relationship yeah. with the sculptures. So anyway, it's trying to be a one-man synthesis of the arts. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, in a conflict with architects who, who think that the synthesis of the arts is a collaborative process. He's, One. He, he's himself all the arts altogether. Professor, one, one last question, because I think this has been uh, a wonderful, uh, insightful presentation. And I think we can have many, many more questions, but I think I will... I will, one culmination of it. You seem to sh reveal a certain ambiguity. I mean, we could call it zigzag, we could call it shift yes. position. But there is a certain ambiguity that Le Corbusier seems to hold to give him a certain uh, freedom to engage with even contradictory forces at times. You know? and, uh, and then meander through this whole um, juxtaposition of politics, the juxtaposition of contradiction, juxtaposition of context and diverse cultures. Uh, what would be the kind of lesson or the several lessons that an architect can derive from this kind of manipulation of one may call? Yes, uh, I, I think it's, uh, well, I, I can't give a, uh, an answer in terms of the content form or the details of the design. But uh, I will um, compare Le Corbusier to Karl Marx. Karl Marx once said, and this is a comparison I of, of, often make, uh, Karl Marx was irritated by the dealings of his uh, uh, supporters. So at some point he said, at least uh, I am not a Marxist. And I think that Le Corbusier never was Corbusian. And this is what explains the, the shock of everyone when he made Ronchamp. Yeah. No one was expecting Ronchamp. No one was mm. expecting this twist. Mm. Uh, even more than someone like Frank Lloyd Wright, you can, uh, well, Falling Water done by Wright when he was 90, mm. uh, a little like Ronchamp, uh, yeah. was a, a big surprise. So only the very the, the great uh, creative minds, scientists, philosophers, mm. Uh, artists, architects are capable of contradicting themselves mm. and of change, of shifting the ground on which they are operating. So uh, if there is a lesson to be learned, it's uh, the significance of anxiety 
the rejection of repetition, uh, not uh, being uh, where you're supposed to be. It's, uh, it's remaining, remaining free creative individuals. And uh, uh, despite, despite all the uh, repetitive and cumulative aspects, this is what Le Corbusier has been able to do. So thank you, Professor Cohen, for that very wonderful uh, presentation. We've, we've almost been here for one hour, 40 minutes, and I think it's a very engaging presentation. Thank you, uh, very, thank yeah. you very much to you, and thank you for your very careful reading of my writings. I see that you <laughs> know them better than I do sometimes. <laughs> thank you, know, you very I, much. I, I, I've, been, I've been, of course, following your writings very intensely and connecting it with, I mean, there's much more we can discuss, but, you know, the, the German thing, the German happening and Behrens and, you know, the, the AEG factory and the fact that he meets me there. I think you have really chronicled, and I, when I listen to Michael Hayes' uh, uh, kind of uh, introduction to you, or, yes. you know, the kind of, one realizes that it's been a very immersive, deep, uh, and if I can just, maybe I, I would like to add this out of curiosity, maybe outside the lecture, but I, have you really kind of identified why you are fascinated by Kubo's you know, uh, Well, I i don't know, but you know, I was trained uh, in the 60s. Uh, the school was still very conservative in Paris. So uh, Le Corbusier was on one hand, um, uh, an opposition force to the Ecole was an alternative, but at the same time, he had, bec he, he had become a sort of academic figure, a sort of established figure. So I think for me, he represented both uh, uh, looking at the roots of his discourse, finding uh, obscured moments like the Russian episode, working on the connection with Germany, also looking at the repressed uh, consideration of landscape was a way for me to um, also to well to to do what uh, intellectuals are supposed to do, which is to criticize, challenge uh, the 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 leading representations in their in their field and and and, and beyond that. So I think that uh, for because that, I think, yeah, I think the value of your research to us has been that till now. Um, we tended to put the arch the master architecture on a pedestal, mm. and it was a visual kind of analysis of their form, you know, and mm -hmm. it got limited to a visual and some analysis, maybe some formal analysis of plan and section. And over the last five or seven years, I find that your research, and correct me if I'm not uh, interpreting, your research is really trying to broaden the ecosystem in which an architect really functions or tries to imagine and therefore all stakeholders become important the authority the client sure. the capitalist and i think that broader picture that your research brings uh, not limiting it to uh, just the form of a building or you know, I think mm -hmm. in some very visual way i think lends uh, much more uh, scholarship in countries like India and Southeast Asia, because many of these are generic elements. You know, they are generic elements. Yes. No, in a way, you know, uh, I will tell you one last thing because I have to leave you. Yeah, sure. uh, often uh, uh, I am characterized in North America in particular as an architectural historian. And for me, it, uh, and I don't like this term. Uh, I think uh, an architect, for me, uh, uh, being qualified as an architectural historian means that you belong, you're almost a satellite of the professional field of architecture. And this is not what, the, what I want to be. Uh, I am much more a historian. It might be, seem silly to make such a subtle a differentiation, but I consider myself as, as a historian operating in and on architecture but from a broader perspective. You can't understand architecture by itself only. You have to, it is inserted in intellectual history, in the history of labor, in the history of, uh, uh, of societies, in the history of power. Uh, it has to be read uh, uh, through a psychological filter. It can't be too 
uh, close and to uh, domesticated by the professional discipline. So that's what I've, I'm trying to do. That's what I'm trying to teach to my doctoral students. Uh, so sometimes uh, successfully. Thank you. Thank you. I Thank think you very much. it's a wonderful note to end the conversation, a more holistic, keeping it open-ended and allowing the complexity and contradiction to coexist. Thank you, Professor Cohen, for finding the time and an amazing uh, talk today. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you for your, your attention. I will send you the PowerPoint presentation so you can uh, circulate it uh, for those who want, uh, who want to uh, to be able to, to revise it. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Good night. Good night.